I'm Dr. T and welcome to my office. I'd like to tell you about a world-changing, absolutely important, revolutionary book. The Skeptical Chemist by Lord Robert Boyle, published 1661. I didn't say it was new. The book itself is an argument against the Aristotelian uh, view of matter, the idea that it's made up of five elements. As an aside, fantasy folks, five elements. You always forget ether. It'd be kind of cool to have that in some stories, you know? But back to the chemistry. Okay, so the book is an attack against that idea, and that's something that really needed to go. And he's trying to update into more of what we would consider chemistry, and that's one of the reasons why he's considered the father of chemistry. Uh, a better idea of what elements are, a better idea of, you know, how the world works. Uh, but that's really not the important part of the book. The important part isn't really what it says, but really what it stands for, uh, the way it says it. See, this is the late 17th century, and at this point the scientific revolution is just about getting ready to kick off, or it is kicking off, and this marks a bit of a watershed in the scientific revolution, because a few things are being changed, and we can see them changing in this book. Boyle takes Francis Bacon's approach, and Boyle would deny that statement, but he kind of did of looking at the world and basing everything on experimentation. The medieval view of philosophy was theory was everything. You logically deduced what was true. Boyle, Francis Bacon, and other Enlightenment uh, philosophers come with thought is, no, you have to test it. Just because you've got a great, wonderful, philosophical thought that fruit falls upwards, even, no matter how perfect and flawless your logic is, the fact that fruit falls down, not up, means that you're wrong. And this was revolutionary. So the book is not based on logical arguments from first principles. It's based on, I did this, this, and this. And by I, I mean Lord Boyle. Now, the next couple of parts are continuations. It's written in English. It's not written in Latin, and it's not encrypted. Before this, a lot of chemical text would be encrypted. Why, you ask? Lack of intellectual property laws. If you're a dyer, and a lot of chemistry started out with dyes, it's kind of the, one of the forgotten origins of chemistry. If you find a new way to make, say, a blue shirt that's a better blue shirt than anybody else, you don't dare tell anyone. Because the only way you're going to profit from that is to make blue shirts. If you tell people, they'll just make other blue shirts and you won't have an edge against them. Now, modern days, we have intellectual property law. We have patents. You find a new blue shirt, you make a patent, boom! You can get people to pay you to make blue shirts. Awesome! Um, but Lord Robert Boyle, as you can probably guess from his title, wasn't really that concerned about uh, patents or intellectual property, because patents weren't a thing back then to say or to speak of. That's because he had all the money he needed. The guy was rich. He was an English lord. Uh, this was his hobby. This is what he did for fun. Uh, he was a polymath, did all kinds of stuff, uh, was mo known mostly in his day for his theology. Uh, but, you know, this was something he did on the side. Now, uh, because of that, he told everyone what he did. Not only did he do so in English, he also did so in sufficient detail that even today, because once again it's in English, a bit of an older style, so it's a little bit of a hard read, you can pick it up and read it and reproduce his experiments. It might be a pain getting a hold of some of the equipment and, you know, there, there's practical considerations here, but enough detail is done in the book that one can redo what he did. And that's actually part of the beauty of it. This is replication, the ability for one author to write down what they have done, the reader to read that and reproduce it. If the reader can reproduce it, yay, it's probably legit. If the reader can't, well, we got a problem here, because if an experiment is true and it's done properly, then it should be reproducible. And this is the core of what Boyle is doing here. He is making an argument using experimental evidence and doing so in a way that you can check him. The proof is built into the argument, or I should say the proof is sitting next to the argument or comes with the argument, that you can check it. You don't just have to take his word for it, and as such, we're leaning on experimentation, not on authority or philosophy or just simply thought. Uh, I'm not going to say go read it. 
Um, but it is an interesting book. And have a wonderful day.